Amen, amen. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Daniel. Alicia and friends as well. Special music, worship. I think my soul is filled today with that wonderful uh, offering of music that we had. Uh, but as my the message for today is going to talk about, uh, it's not just the soul and the spirit that we need to utilize to be filled. There's going to be a couple of more uh, elements. But before I get uh, into the message for today, if you could bow your heads with me for one more uh, word of prayer at this moment. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, glorify your name and to be here uh, in your presence. We ask that your Holy Spirit uh, be here with us and that it can guide me uh, and that your words may be spoken through me as your instrument today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Ah, we're going to talk today about my favorite Bible verses. Uh, being a pastor's kid, a uh, university rat, you go through tons of Bible verses. You're memorizing, they give you stickers, there's a bunch of things. Um, but eventually, uh, by the age of like nine, I kind of settled into this one. Uh, because it was, it was not just something that I learned in Spanish. Uh, so the title right there says, my dad being a pastor, had the wonderful idea to teach an eight-year-old kid Hebrew. I don't know if he was already preparing me for the seminary. Didn't go to seminary, Dad. I'm so glad my father is here. After many, many months of not being able to be here, they, they've been able to come uh, and visit us. But I learned this passage of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8. Right? It's the Shema. This is something that every child in the Hebrew uh, tradition is taught. Our neighbors, down across where, where I might, no, our neighbors <laughs> over here at the JCC is something that they still teach to this day, right? Maybe they do it in English. They don't necessarily have to teach it in Hebrew. But to give you a little better context of where um, the Shema is coming from, the whole book of Deuteronomy, right, is Moses' farewell, Okay. He already spoke to God. He got the good news and bad news. It's like, it's time to go. You guys are going to the promised land. But, <laughs> my dear Moses, you're going to have to be staying behind. All right? So what does a leader do? It prepares its people. It prepares the team. Now, by no means am I Moses, right? But I do have a lot of space for my church family in my heart. We've gone through troubling times, our time in the desert called COVID-19. Recently, we've had our difficulties during this time. We've also learned a lot of things during this time. We've learned about ourselves. We learned how to use technology. We learned different ways to interact, right? And as we go into this new um, summer and the new school semester, there's also plenty of changes. There's also going to be plenty of opportunities, just like the promised land represented. But Moses, at this critical time, before the people of Israel enter uh, Canaan and the, and the promised land, gives them three, in essence, three different messages, right? And he's at, uh, at the Mount of Moab. And he's talking to them, right? Now, the first one is relatively short, right? It's just chapters one through four. He's, he's all about remember, right? And this is what I just mentioned. We've had difficulties. We've had to wear masks. We've had to study from home, work from home, right? But there were plenty of miracles. TCE, we were able to remain open for several uh, weeks. We were able to connect with technology with different people. There were different miracles that God had manifested. So Moses wanted the people of Israel to remember all of those miracles, right? That Red Sea parting, that was, that was just a couple of years ago. Don't you forget about that, right? We have to understand where we come from to know where we, we're headed, right? Now, the second part is where I'm going to sp spend a little bit more of time. He's speaking about to the people of Israel about now. What is going to happen now that you're going to Go and take advantage of the opportunity of being able to enter the promised land. What is it that we have to be doing in this moment? And then the third speech, which is the chapters 27 
through 34, he focuses on the promised land, right? And God's promises. God had promised a lot of different elements uh, about a Savior coming. There's going to be future things to come, even though they were going to be able to accomplish so many things once they enter the promised land. There were still going to be plenty of promises for the future. I guess uh, through Moses, God knew we might be uh, a little bit impatient, right? Uh, my children are already thinking about their birthdays. They're a couple of months ago, and what are, like there's still plenty of months. But I guess it's human nature, right? God made all of these promises, and the people of Israel were expecting those deliveries to come shortly. So that that part of the message, uh, Moses is reminding, yes, there's going to be plenty of blessings. In due time, God is good. All of the time, there will be those blessings um, to come. So the reason I want to spend time in one of the, uh, in this Bible verse is it is quite interesting how it has evolved and maybe how understanding of this Bible verse has become a little bit lost throughout the time, right? We often know this verse, and not by its origins in the Old Testament, but by the time when Jesus mentioned this in Matthew 22, 37, right? But he's actually quoting the Shema in Deuteronomy, right? So what does it say here? Let me go. I have the, I was looking at different English versions. That is one of the things I often forget. I don't really know what language I'm thinking a lot of the times. And I noticed like halfway through my preparation that I was doing everything in Spanish. So like, okay, hold on. Let me, let me, let me go into uh, translator mode, go to my English references here uh, a little bit. So I ended up settling on the New International Version. and This is where I'm going to be reading from. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6 verses 4, we're just going to go through 7. It would take me way, way, way longer uh, to expand and really go in depth uh, more of the verses that I love here. But we start here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be in your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk to them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Hear, O Israel. Shema Israel. That is what the, the title had there. Shema Israel. We're going to hear this Moses uh, quoting or, or, or starting a lot of his uh, um, sayings during Deuteronomy with, Hear me, O Israel. Like, pay attention. Right? Listen up. This is important. We have plenty of teachers here. They all have their tricks. Some of them like to bang on the desk. Some of them grab the chalk and go like this at the chalkboard. I had a history professor. Was this Monte Morelos or was this Glendale? No, this was Glendale uh, Adventist Academy in California, fourth grade. She just liked to clap. I like, just went like, like old school like that. We're like, okay, I guess this is important, right? So when Moses in Deuteronomy says, Shema Israel," he's like, hear me, people. All right. I know I've gone forever. This is three long messages. Way more than going to preach. But here, let's, let's focus on this part again. There's one God and only one God. The nation of Israel was surrounded by polytheistic cultures, right? We are surrounded by a culture that doesn't always have the same values that we have. So Moses was reminding the people, listen, you have one God. Remember your values. You are different. Now, in a previous sermon, I talked about how being different sometimes is challenging, right? It feels unsafe to be different. So he was reminding them, you might feel uncomfortable. You might feel peer pressure to do what the uh, Canaanites, the Philistines, what, what they are doing to fit in. You know what happens, but that's maybe for another sermon. But he was already telling them, you have one God. He is the only God. You are different. Your values are different. Remember that. What do you have to do? This is the key elements here, 
right? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. What is the difference between our heart and our soul? Can there be a difference between the heart and the soul that you have, right? This is Moses being inspired by God to deliver a very important message to the people of Israel as they were getting ready to enter the promised land. I think I blanked it. We're going to start first by exploring what the passage means by all of your heart. The Hebrew word here for heart is lebab, right? This uh, comes from a different uh, root of leb traditionally. And when, depending on if you're speaking to multiple people, if it's future, present, past tense, you'll see it slightly different, right? But um, the origin is that I use for the preparation of this sermon uses lebab, right? So as we go and study how this word was used in different contexts, when the people of Israel, the Hebrews, the Israelites, the Jewish people talk about the heart, it's not maybe what we expect. When we think about heart, we may be thinking about St. Valentine's, right? The emotional aspect, how your heart rate changes when you're scared, when you're angry, uh, when you're experiencing different emotions. But in the context of the people of Israel, Heart is actually the place of reason, the place of logic, the place of thoughts. This is why in 1 Kings 9.27, we see that it is asking for a wise heart to think fully with your heart. As we see in different passages that are written in Aramaic, we see it time and time again. Uh, through the very exciting chapters of Chronicles. Ooh, that was, that was a fun part of the preparation, but there's plenty of good stuff. It's, it can be a little challenging, right? But you're, you're seeing uh, the different kings, right? We see the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Israel. Some kings, remember these words that were given to the people of Israel and guide the nation to follow God. Other kings get enthralled with the surrounding nations and they start deviating, right? So in Chronicles, we often see that when they say, and the heart of Jehovah or the heart of such king was with God, this is the word that we're seeing. Their thoughts. They were thinking about the, the commandments. They were thinking about the law of Moses and making choices. They were making policy decisions that best align with their understanding of the law of Moses. A wise heart, a, a heart in the context of a Jewish culture means our reason, our thought process. And this is why in that verse, the next part, all of your soul comes for the Hebrew word nefesh. Nefesh has a very interesting uh, origin because it's, it's used, uh, is referenced about 700 times um, in the Bible. It is also referenced in Genesis. When God created man, he provided humankind with the breath of life. It is oftentimes when the, when the spirit of life is referenced this is what the, the, the Bible is utilizing, the word nefesh. That life is also utilized in different passages when it comes to the passion and the emotions. Now, my fellow musicians like myself, we may be during rehearsal, we're looking at how it sounds, what key, I think it was in the key of A for today, if I heard correctly. There are some technical aspects 
to playing music. But once we get down those basic technical aspects, a lot of times when we're rehearsing, we talk about something's missing. We're missing the soul of the song. We're missing the emotional aspects. We're missing, missing the passion components of that specific song, of that specific music. So in the Hebrew context, when we, when we hear the word nefesh, or we see it uh, throughout scripture, we are often looking at that spirit element of life, of passion, of the emotions. I want you to think about friendships, relationships that you have, and just reflect on the fact that it would be pretty difficult to be in a friendship, in a relationship, if there were no emotions, right? Those are more business relationships. Those are business acquaintances. You can have a work relationship and be dispassionate about it. But once you are close with something, once it becomes a meaningful relationship, there's going to be different types of emotions. Now, in psychology, this is what we look for when we are evaluating healthy relationships. We look for healthy emotional bonds or emotional connections, right? If those are missing or if the uh, emotional components are not the healthiest, right, there's going to be plenty uh, of challenges in that relationship. And this is often what we talk about, the importance of our Christian walk. We frequently reference the importance of having a relationship with Jesus. But a lot of times we focus, and this is very important, learning the doctrines, learning the commandments, learning the different stories of the Bible. This is the first part, right? This is the first part of the commandment. Use your heart, which we now know in the Hebrew context means use your mind, use your reason, use your logic, remember them. A lot of, um, I'm not, most of the people in the in in the time of Moses were not literal. So they had to memorize. Yes, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. They had to memorize all of that by the age of 13. Use your mind, use your memory. Make sure you know these passages. But it's not just about that. God wants our connection with him to be more than just knowing what he's told different prophets throughout time. He wants to have a relationship. He wants to have an emotional connection with us. This is where the, the word nefesh is so important in this passage. Love your Lord with all of your heart and all of your soul. We are encouraged to combine the reason and our emotional nature. God created us this way. He gave us emotions. Emotions, like I mentioned, is what helps us have healthy relationships. So those are the emotions that will help us have a closer connection with God. Faith is more than an emotion. If not, we wouldn't see the other two words in this great commandment, right? I know there's the concern of, of that our, our experience can be purely emotional. And I understand that concern. But we don't just see nefesh by itself. We see nefesh, we live up, and we'll see merdecha, the next word here. But it's included because it's important. And so many times we forget about those components because we tend to overemphasize the logic. Now, there's plenty of reasons why that emphasis came about. We can track it to... Um, the influence that the Greeks had on St. Augustine and St. Thomas and how they describe uh, primarily the, the writings of Paul, they created this dualistic approach of the mind and the soul being separate from the body. Right? We see that uh, throughout uh, European philosophy quite often. But we have to remember that the people of Israel are Middle Eastern. That is the context of how they grew up culturally the Jewish traditions, the traditions that Jesus participated in were grounded in that Middle Eastern uh, context. One last word here, like I mentioned. Meodeja. 
This is with all of your might, all of your strength, right? That is what God is asking. He's not like, just think about me a little bit, feel those that passion, but just a little bit, and then use the other half of, of your strength, of your mind and your soul for your work or for school, right? Multitasking, not efficient. Research, 10 years of research has shown that multitasking is not efficient. We, get, we, gave, it, we gave it space. And we said, like, maybe it's a generational thing, right? Maybe children uh, who grew up in this setting can actually multitask better than their parents. Sorry, young people, the studies have come back. Multitasking, although you feel more productive, if we measure productivity, it's actually less. What works is test switching, which is concentrating fully on one thing, stopping, concentrating fully on the other thing, and coming back. That's a little bit more of a dynamic flow, but it still requires full attention. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy, when you focus on the Lord, focus with all of it, all your might, all your strength. Another element that comes from Meldeha is all of your resources. Is my technology focusing on the Lord? Are my finances focusing on the Lord? Is my property being utilized to love the Lord? That is what this great commandment asks for us. That we take in consideration everything that we have, not just ourselves, but the resources that we've been given by God, and to focus that on Him. This is what Jesus was referencing in Matthew, right? There is one Lord, and we should love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. What he adds there in Matthew, he also adds the neighbor, because he's like, well, I guess it should have been obvious that if you love me in this way, how could you hate your neighbor? But we are human, and we see how we get things twisted uh, uh, frequently, so he he added that component in Matthew. But here we see in Deuteronomy, that's, that's what God wants us to do. That's what he is hoping that we can continue to do. Now, this is not something that we just learn once and let it go. He also tells us that we have to do this when we rise up and when we lie down. It has to be part of our tradition. It has to be part of our routines this element of connecting with God, connecting with him daily, in the morning and at night. One of the challenges that uh, I've been encountering uh, frequently in in my my weekly work as a psychotherapist is that a lot of people are coming to me with anxiety. They've just gone through a lot or there's a lot of uncertainty in the future. And they're having difficulty doing their tasks, being in school, doing their work, being with their family, because they have this sensation of of anxiety. Now, there are definitely some very valid concerns about um, more Buddhist meditation. That element of meditation clearly can be uh, dangerous, and it is not part of, of a Christian approach to a lifestyle. But the fact of meditating and breathing has biblical roots. There are plenty of passages that talk about the element of meditating in the Lord. Here we see Psalms 11, 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mock but whose delight is the law of the Lord and who meditates in his law day and night. We also see uh, a similar uh, concept in Psalms 143, verse 5. And he says, I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. We also see it in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. 
Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, meditate on such things. This is the concept of meditation. It's giving all of your undivided attention to one single thing when it comes from this Hebrew perspective. It means to do it with all of your heart, all of your might, and all of your soul. To fully embrace what God has done for us. And to do so in a concentrated, focused, and calm manner. And calmness is difficult to find nowadays. That's what I mentioned. It's like people who are believers. Like, I try to read my Bible, but... All of these thoughts, just all of the worries. I can't concentrate on my devotion. I can't concentrate on my Sabbath school, right? Because there's so much anxiety. I hear that so often. One of the most effective ways to find that calmness, to be able to utilize our thoughts and our emotions with all of our resources, with all of our strength, and with all of our intention, comes through the act of deep breathing, right? And here I'm going to go to um, some Ellen G. White uh, quotes, and you're going to have to excuse my uh, page numbers. Um, Like I mentioned before, some of this was developed in Spanish, and the page numbers do not (laughs) always uh, align, but uh, it is in 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 that book and roughly around those page numbers as well. Uh, So from Desire uh, of Ages, page 329, in the Spanish version, it says that, although we should work fervently in the salvation of the lost, we should also dedicate time to meditation, to prayer, and to the study of the Word of God. And that we should do so, and this is in Select Messages on Education, and we should practice with perseverance, speaking softly, and exercising our abdominal muscles for deep breathing. There's a couple more passages there where um, in Messages of Health, and we hear Alan G. White, through her writings, talk about the benefits of deep breathing, right? Now, recently, we have utilize this concept. Technically, it's called diaphragmatic breathing. Those who sing and are part of that area know the importance of diaphragmatic breathing for being able to project. But biologically, we've incorporated a lot of those elements because that type of breathing, not your chest breathing, right? that slow, deep breathing, sends a very important signal to that limbic system. We often know that uh, an enlarged amygdala or a hyperactive amygdala is related to uh, um, aggression, fear responses, anxiety is what it comes a lot from. When we engage in that process, the area of the amygdala starts to calm down. We see it with the fMRIs, right, real time. We ask people, we give them different techniques. And we see the activity in the brain slowly from a yellow to a bright red, which means a lot of activity. We start, we see it reducing it into a light blue. We also see it physically on the way the person is reacting. We see less shaking, less palpitations. We see a change in their eyes and their facial uh, expressions as well. This is the aspect of being able to find peace and calmness. Now, I can work with these techniques uh, in my practice, and I do, and I see their benefits. I have many years of experience working with individuals uh, with anxiety and other disorders, but it can take a long time. And it's quite fascinating when I do have the privilege of working with people who share the Christian faith, and we can reference Deuteronomy. We can reference the Psalms, right? In your presence, I am safe. This diaphragmatic breathing sends the signal to change our brain responses from flight or flight 
to that rest and digest state. No matter what's happening, no matter what we may be worried, no matter what the context is, this is one of the keys that allows us to ground ourselves in the present moment. And when that present moment involves the Holy Spirit, we are connecting, we are enhancing our relationship, we are enhancing our bond with Jesus Christ, which is what he ultimately wanted. When he was walking with Adam and Eve, he was having a relationship. When he came in this earth, he didn't just set up a, a, a school and all use all the knowledge, right, and gave all the corrections and then said, all right, guys, go, go teach, right? He first had a relationship with his sons, who then went sent out in a similar mission to preach, but more than anything, to connect with the community of believers so that they could grow together in Christ. This is something that we, it might be foreign to us, right? We have that element of thinking about our mind and our body, our soul, in different components. But we were created as a totality, as a perfect unison. Sin has definitely chipped away of that, has broken it. The enemy definitely uses emotions to get us into trouble. But he also uses reason and logic to keep us far away from God. This is why in, in the Shema, and through Moses, he reminds his people, don't just use your logic. Don't just use your emotions. Use both of them with all your heart and all of your intention. So I hope that as we leave today, we can take this message to focus on God with all of that we have, and that we can make it a daily practice as we rise and as we go to bed, to keep connected with him as we encounter the many opportunities that we'll be having uh, through the summer and through the next semester that we can encounter them as well so that we can hasten his coming by spreading the message of Jesus Christ and the love that he has for us. That is what my hope is for all of you today. I hope you are um, taking this message and let's bow our heads for one last word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us and sending your son so that he could die for us and we can have that freedom from sin. All we have to do is accept him as our Savior. And all we have to do is love you. Love you with everything that we are. With our thoughts, with our resources, with our emotions. Please help us find that connection with you. That we can utilize all of us, every single inch of us, to worship you, to praise you. And we can do so by showing our neighbors, those who are around us, the love that you have for them as well. For your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.